This is the last video I'm going to make discussing um, the Enterobacteriaceae family. I've kind of had them spread throughout your curriculum, but I kind of just wanted to finish up with these last couple of members and highlight a couple of them. Um, the Enterobacteriaceae, I, I have a separate video that just kind of goes through what they are and how they are, and I recommend you watch that. This is just um, kind of an overview of their characteristics. So these are a really important um, family, a very large family of gram-negative um, rods. Uh, the reason they're all in this one group, this Enterobacteriaceae group, is that they all share this common antigen, the Enterobacterial or Enterobacteriaceae common antigen. Um, biochemically, they also share some other features. They're all catalase positive and oxidase negative. And one of the ways you can begin to differentiate them is looking at McConkey auger. So some of the Enterobacteriaceae are lactose fermenters and some are not. So when you have um, lactose fermentation, you're going to see uh, a red or pink color. The only one here that I might kind of like caution you on is actually serratia. Serratia is capable of lactose fermentation, but it does it really, really slowly. So if you look, you know, for 24 hours later, it might look negative and you might say, oh, that's a non-fermenter. So it's got to be one of these. But then if you had saved it for like 72 hours, you might see, you know, a nice pink color. Um, and it's just that it's serratia and it takes a while. Um, so if you have other um, questions about Enterobacteriaceae, I recommend you go back and um, watch that video. Um, we have talked about almost all of the other ones. Um, there are videos on Salmonella. Um, I also made a really long video on E. coli going through all the different presentations, EHEC, ETEC, EPEC, EIEAC, um, all of those. Um, and we talked about Klebsiella as well. So now we're just going to kind of finish up. Um, I just made a Shigella video that has also been uploaded to YouTube. So in this one, we're going to talk about Yersinia. Yersinia is obviously a really important pathogen. It wiped out a third of Europe at one point in history. Um, and then we're going to finish up with um, Enterobacter, Citrobacter, and Serratia. All right, so let's start with Yersinia. Um, the most um, famous member of this family is Yersinia pestis. Yersinia pestis is the cause of the Black Plague or plague in general, um, and it's been a major mover and shaker in the course of human history with the amount of people it has killed. Um, but there are two other forms that we'll talk about briefly. Um, why enterocolitica? This basically just causes a gastroenteritis. Um, so we'll talk about that in a minute. And then why pseudotuberculosis? So what does that tell you? It acts like tuberculosis. It looks like tuberculosis, but it's not tuberculosis. So um, causes like a pneumonia-like symptom. Um, like the other Enterobacteriaceae that I've talked about, it does have a type 3 secretion system, um, and it is able to kind of escape from um, phagocytic machinery, just like um, Shigella. It is a zoonotic, and that's actually really, really important. We are often accidental hosts, and that's um, pretty much what led to the Black Plague, was it wasn't so much that um, we were you know, spreading it person to person, although that can happen. It's that basically the fleas of the rats were then jumping onto us and biting us, and then we were getting sick. Um, so it's a zoonotic illness, and it does have its own life cycle. And it actually is also playing a role um, ecologically. There are um, various uh, mammals right now that are actually in danger of extinction um, just because of Black Plague, um, specifically the black-tailed prairie dog and the endangered black-footed ferret are under threat as a result of Yersinia pestis. So um, we are not the only ones that fear this one. It has kind of an interesting look under the microscope. So um, You can see here, um, it's trying to motion it here. It looks almost like a safety pin. So if you think back to, I don't know, any time you've seen a safety pin, I mean, I associate them with like weddings or, I don't know, clothes fixing or babies, which is funny because you would never give a baby a safety pin. But anyway, it has kind of this safety pin look to it under um, 
imaging. Um, I'm not really sure what causes that look necessarily, but um, it's one of those buzzwords that sometimes shows up that it's just good to kind of keep in mind that this safety pin um, appearance under gram staining is often indicative of um, your cinea. Okay, so let's talk about the clinical disease of your cinea and its various friends. Um, the first one that probably comes to people's mind is bubonic plague. And it's called bubonic plague because of the appearance of buboes. And this right here, this gentleman right here has a bubo right here. That's what this is, this giant um, lump near the lymph node. Um, bubonic plague has a very specific um, timeline. Um, basically, you've got an incubation of less than seven days. Um, after a person has been bitten by an infected flea. The patient will develop a really high fever, um, and then the development of these buboes in the groin or axilla. Um, typically what happens then is that Yersinia pestis is a really fast replicator, just ridiculously fast. So the patient develops bacteremia, and um, that leads basically to septic plague. Um, and in that case, uh, the, the patient is going to die. I, I mean, 75% of patients die from this. Um, bacteremia develops rapidly. So unless you get treated almost before any of these symptoms, you need to get treated before these seven days, um, prognosis is not good. There's also pneumonic plague. Um, this is also caused by Y. pestis. Um, it starts after about a two to three day incubation period. Um, and at this point, the patient will begin to experience fever, malaise, and pulmonary systems symptoms. Um, these patients are highly infectious. And this is actually one of the things that became really problematic during the various epidemics is that then it's aerosolized, right? You know, a patient coughs or whatever, and they're just spreading organisms to their close contacts. Um, so it's highly infectious and the mortality rate in untreated patients and with this aerosolized plague approaches 90%. So both of these, you can see really high mortality rates, um, treatment, you need to get it on board as quickly as possible. Um, why enterocolitica uh, basically causes enterocolitis. Um, this is about one to 10 days after ingestion of the contaminated food products or water. Um, patients will experience diarrhea, fever, abdominal pain. This one will last about one to two weeks. There is a chronic form of the disease that can also develop that persists for months, but that's not common. Um, and one of the things to note is that sometimes this one looks kind of like appendicitis. Um, I don't really know why it looks like appendicitis, but that is, you'll see the same symptoms of um, pain that shows up there. So this is still something, you know, a lot of people think of plague as something that happened a long time ago um, that we don't really need to worry about anymore. And I, I guess that's true, um, but there still are hundreds of cases of plague and actually even thousands of cases of plague that um, show up in the world every year. Um, so the main place that we actually see plague is uh, Madagascar. Um, and then the other place is Sub-Saharan Africa. These are the places with the highest incidences of plague. So plague is not gone, it is not dead. And actually we do also still see it in the continental United States. Now, thankfully we don't see that many. Um, so this is an infograph uh, from the CDC. And basically between 2000 and 2016, you know, the highest incidence we had was in 2006 when there were 17 cases of plague. But most years it's around, you know, two to five cases of plague per year. And you can see that in many of those years, nobody died. Um, there were several deaths, but not a terrible amount because we are able to treat it now effectively and we have methods for taking care of that. Um, so plague is still something that happens. Um, that we need to be careful of. Okay, so how are we going to diagnose it? How are we going to treat it? Diagnosis is pretty easy. Um, presence of the organism in the blood, stool, sputum, or from the lymph node of a suspected bubo. So um, in the patient I showed on the last slide, uh, he had that big bubo in the axilla. This is a terrible stick figure of a human over here, but 
um, go with me that this is a human. Um, so you would take uh, a sample straight from this lymph node, but you can also just look in the blood or the stool or the sputum, depending on symptoms. Obviously, sputum would be for patients who are experiencing pulmonary. Um, and if it's in the blood, you really need to get moving fast because we don't want to move to septicemia. Um, you can also do direct fluorescence antibody detection or PCR. So you, you can look for it for a, from a variety of ways. And remember, um, presence of the organism, you actually can kind of do because it does have that kind of prototypical um, safety pin appearance that might help you distinguish fairly quickly, are you dealing with plague? Now, you'd probably still want to confirm. You don't want to, you know, be like the boy who cried wolf and cried plague, but, you know, that is a uh, potential. Treating it, um, I've really only listed treatments here for enterocolitica and pestis. Most enterocolitica um, uh, illnesses are self-limited. The patient's going to recover no problem. Like I said, there are those rare cases where patients experience a chronic condition, in which case you might consider an antibiotic. With Yersinia pestis, you need to treat immediately. You need to treat uh, with streptomycin, and you also want to treat close contacts because we don't want to run the risk that somebody has been exposed. Better to just treat them, and then we know everybody is okay. All right, so quickly, I just want to go through a couple more of the Enterobacteriaceae, um, particularly these four organism, organisms, Enterobacter, Citrobacter, Morganella, and Serratia. Um, they're all Enterobacteriaceae, like Yersinia. Um, Enterobacter, Citrobacter, and Serratia are all lactose fermenters. Remember I said at the beginning of the video that um, Serratia ferments lactose very slowly, so you might not see it right away. Um, Morganella is non-lactose fermenting, um, so that's kind of a distinguishing factor there. For all four of these, Enterobacter, Citrobacter, Morganella, and Serratia, these are largely nosocomial infections. Um, you don't really tend to find these in immunocompetent individuals just walking around. These aren't uh, normally a community-acquired infection. We associate these with either neonates, immunocompromised patients, or patients who have recently been in the hospital. Um, and because we associate them with patients who have recently been in the hospital, we also associate them with high multidrug resistance because patients in hospitals are often on antibiotics and then they get released from the hospital and may or may not continue taking their antibiotics or their antibiotic regimen might have changed. And now we have increased the um, resistance that these organisms have to various antibiotics. So they can be really tricky to treat is kind of the um, take home message there. So I'm just going to go through a couple distinguishing features of each of these guys. So we're going to start with Enterobacter. The first thing about Enterobacter is that it's motile. So you may, um, you can do a motility test and it would be positive. And that would be one way of differentiating it from some of the other Enterobacteriaceae. Like many of the organisms below, it's a major cause of UTIs um, and pneumonia. In fact, I think all of them can cause UTIs or pneumonia or both. Um, it's also a major cause of meningitis, particularly in neonates. Um, and part of the reason for that is that it can also go systemic. So you may also see bacteremia as a result of Enterobacter. Citrobacter, meningitis in neonates, again, is actually a big one for that. And because of that, we also expect bacteremia. And we also expect brain abscesses as well as UTIs. Morganella, we're a little more concerned about pneumonia as opposed to meningitis. But meningitis is still on our menu, as is bacteremia. This one has also been associated with septic arthritis. Um, we'll talk talk a lot about septic arthritis when we get to your musculoskeletal block. Um, there are some organisms that kind of have a predilection or trophism or whatever for the space between your joints. And then the inflammation there um, can obviously be very painful. And that's septic arthritis, basically. I, I want to take a quick minute to talk about serratia. Serratia is one of those ones that I never really used to focus on, used to teach. But it is kind of coming up in the world. It is becoming a bit more common. Um, like Enterobacter, it is motile. Um, it also has this classic presentation of producing a slightly red pigment in culture. Um, 
So, and you've probably seen serratia and not known it was serratia before. So it likes to grow in damp places. So like if you maybe go a little too long without cleaning your shower and you get that kind of red ring around your shower. Um, I know in college, a group of girls, nobody wanted to be the one to clean the shower. Um, you know, you, you might see a little bit of that pink ring and that pink ring is serratia. So over the course of a day or two, it'll start to create this um characteristic hue. Um, it causes a whole bunch of things, UTIs, pneumonia, conjunctivitis, meningitis, and bacteremia, and it can be really difficult to treat. One of the ones it's kind of known for causing is um, abdominal surgical infections. So one of the places you might think of this is actually like um, OB. So a patient has a cesarean section, and then, uh, you know, a couple days later develops a fever and comes to find out that they've got an infection in their abdominal wall and it is serratia. So that obviously was a nosocomial infection that they acquired while they were in-house. And um, that actually did happen to a friend of mine and thankfully she is okay, but these are difficult to treat. So um, you don't wanna let them get too far ahead of you. Um, it also can cause soft tissue infections and these soft tissue infections can lead to um, necrotizing fasciitis basically. So it can be a, um, an eating infection, right? One that is flesh eating and can destroy tissue. So again, difficult to treat, um, obviously can cause some really um, serious um, clinical syndromes, meningitis, bacteremia, necrotizing fasciitis, all really unpleasant things. So you just wanna keep an eye out for these and make sure that you're aware of what the um, infectious disease group, wherever you're practicing, recommends to treat them because um, they can be difficult.